Thank you, Alex. And in many years, and the Pathway Project really is something that we um, and Alex should be proud of. Um, what we know is that Aidan Halligan was really a pioneer. He was an advocate. He was somebody who spoke out and he believed in speaking out. And that's really why we're here today. And that's why it's such an honor for me to be here today. Um, we all need to give a voice to homeless children. And I hope today together we can give that voice to them. But Aidan Halligan was you know, somebody who was also close to my heart because as we know, he was from Leicester. He worked in Leicester, he was a professor at Leicester of maternal and fetal medicine. And so he, I'm sure, would have been very, um, a, a feeling that we are doing the right thing today to be talking about the beginning of life and the life course approach to homelessness. So thank you so much for inviting me to do this lecture today. In addition to that, I would actually really like to honor this lecture um, from my personal perspective to Alex's father as well. Um, Dr. Bax was a community pediatrician and he pioneered the way forward also for community pediatrics. And being community pediatri pediatrician myself, I think it's really important that we remember who has championed the pathway to look at children in a very, very holistic way and think of children, not just as little adults, but people who live within an environment and who are nurtured within an environment in who actually we should be all working together across sectors, education, health, housing, environment, to give them all a better future. And as we also know, today is International Women's Day, and it's also the Commonwealth Day. So all in all, I mean, it's just an amazing start to the evening, and a big, big thank you so much for actually inviting me here to be honoured by doing this talk. But now to move on to the actual lecture I want to give. And before I start going into the main talk, I'm not going to give you lots of data. I'm not going to give you lots and lots of information. I really want to start the next two days with thinking about concepts, thinking about what does this mean for children? And to do that, I wanted to start with a poem that I've written. Now, some people will be laughing at me um, because I'm not a poet. However, I have been thinking about how to translate information from all these publications that we write into a way that actually moves people and actually means that we think more deeply about what we're trying to do. So in these crazy moments of lockdown, I thought of um, what did this research mean to me and how could I try and get this across to you today? So even if you ignore the rest of my lecture, that's fine, but please just take a few moments to, to listen to um, this poem. I lay my head while I try and rest. The raindrops leaking through the chimney breast. The wind howls hard and drives me insane. How can I sleep in the dark once again? The door shams slut. The door shams shut. Can I see a man? Is it my shadow or maybe my nan? My stomach turns, my body shakes. No food, no warmth. Am I really unsafe? Am I invisible to you all out there? Can you not see me? Or do you choose not to care? So I hope those words brought to life a little bit about what I'm going to try and say to you. Where I really want to start is for us to think about what is a home? The word home has been used a lot in the last year through COVID. We talk about being locked down at home, um, being in our home environment, um, and people use the word very easily, home is where the heart is. Um, but actually, what does home mean to other people? What is a home? What does it actually mean? Now, to many of us, a home is somewhere where we remember the smells of the cooking, or we remember um, the pictures on the wall, or we remember um, the drawings that we did with our parents, and then we could hang them up around us, or that bedroom that felt so warm and, and lovely. But actually, that's not what it's like for many people. The home that should be a secure place for children, where there's a place of safety, a place of nurturing, often doesn't feel like that. And that's really what I want to talk to you about today, is how, what is the concept of the home for children experiencing homelessness? And why is that concept, not just a house, but a home, so, so important to them? So I want you just to have a look at this quote. Home 
is a notion that only nations of the homeless fully appreciate and only the uprooted comprehend. Now, when you think of homelessness and children experiencing homelessness, look at these two images here. On the left, something that we often think of in our minds, children in low middle income countries, uh, poor, living on the streets, no home, wandering around in the dirt. On the right hand side is the reality in the UK. And this is what we talk about the hidden pandemic. How many people really know that families are squeezed into a tiny little box, tiny, tiny little box where the children can hardly move, where they can't utilize their limbs, where they're all breathing the same air, where there's fungus on the walls and where they're cooking and sleeping in the same place. I can tell you all of you here on, on this audience are the converted. You're all here because you believe in what we're doing. But actually, when I just go and walk around and talk to people out there, if I mention this to many people, it's not what conjures up into their minds about homelessness. So again, you all know this, but just to remind ourselves, when we talk about children and homelessness, what are the different types of homelessness we're talking about? Do these all apply to children? Well, yes. Children can end up in shelters, um, particularly with their um, mothers who may have had domestic violence. B&Bs, either these are um, council B&Bs or private B&Bs where they're surrounded by people who are noisy, having to share bathrooms, having to share kitchens, sofa surfing. Um, you know, these are the hidden children. Many of the children are sofa surfing, but not counted in the numbers. And then there's the other types of um, homelessness. So just some data to really bring us to life. 253,620 people live, living in temporary accommodation in March, 2020, that's horrendous. It's huge numbers. 50% of those people are children. And 64% of households, when we talk about households in temporary accommodation are families. And children in temporary accommodation increased, increased by 73% in the last 10 years. And we are sure that post COVID, this is going up again. So many of you will have read the Children's Commissioner report and it's a very, very important report. If you just look at those numbers again, we talk about 120,000 children in temporary accommodation. We talk about 90,000 children who may be sofa surfing. And that means those children probably are not counted in the numbers, people don't know where they are. And that gives us 210,000 children who are actually homeless, 210,000 children. And we're talk not talking about a low middle income country here, we're talking about the UK. So again, another diagram which helps us to actually get the figures in perspective. There are children who are homeless, we've just talked about that, but there's 375,000 children living in families at financial risk of becoming homeless. That means they are gonna fall into homelessness. That takes the numbers way up, way up. This is a tsunami waiting to happen. But why am I really here today? And what am I trying to advocate for? And what do I want to shout out about? Well, let's start at the very beginning. That's always what I try and say. The first thousand and one days, some people call it thousand days, thousand and one days of life are crucial to a child's development. And we are talking about people who will become adults of tomorrow. Little ones who actually our, our future, who will give economic growth to our country. So the first thousand of days when mothers are pregnant are crucial and the child becomes six months, goes up to two years. And now we're now extending that critical age to five years old. We call this the critical age of opportunity. You do the right thing at this age, you can make a huge difference for the future. Reduces mental health, reduces alcoholism. You know all about this and you'll be talking about it over the next few days. But what I'm trying to indicate here is we need to invest in these early days of life. We talk about nutrition and actually you can see at the bottom of this slide, you know, if we give new, good nutrition to children, we can see how that actually affects the economy of our country, how it affects the grades children will get at school and their general health. So what do children actually need? They need building blocks. And I like to think of them as building blocks. We need different type of building blocks in our life. And these are, are portrayed before you. Biological, um, physiological, we talk a little bit about that. Safety, security, belonging, 
self-esteem, you need to feel good about yourself and self-actualization. But there's so many barriers to this. So this is a, a, a slide that was created by my, um, um, my PhD student, Anna Rosenthal. She's been working for a couple of years now more on this area and actually been looking at what are the barriers to optimal health in children under five for those children experiencing homelessness. And if you actually look at this slide, it's, you probably can't see all the words because there's, there's so many. And that's the whole point. The whole point is that for children experiencing homelessness, there are so many barriers to optimal health from the individual family level to the community level to the systems level. I mean, if you just look at a few of those, accessing healthcare, how to navigate the health system, unhealthy environments, trying to access appointments, um, trying to get healthy food, language differences, cultural differences. It goes on and on and on and on. So the key aspects of a child's development is that we have to have good biological, physical um, uh, achievement, which in, it means that you will get uh, a good height, good weight, good health, makes us sturdy, makes us be able to um, um, get out there in the world, really. Socio-emotional, you've got to be able to understand others. You've got to be able to understand how others behave. You need to have, be able to perceive things. You need to be able to think and understand how the world works. And then you also need to have good motor development. So we'll come to these now. Your first 1,000 days are crucial to your brain development, crucial. 80 to 85% of your brain actually grows in the first 1,000 days. Neural connections just running around, you know, it's just so, got so many of these neural connections developing. And that's when, if you have stress, if your brain is stressed, actually these start going wrong. So if you have environmental stress, if you're having to move from house to house, if you have noise around you, you don't have that attachment, this is when things go wrong. As you can see from this diagram here, you can see that there are a number of different social states, stages in life, sensory, language, higher cognitive function. This starts before birth and then moves through early life. Again, we, we know from studies, the more stress there is on a child's brain, the more these connections go wrong. And this is some data just trying to show you about um, school meals really. And it shows you here that if you do, the sort of alignment is that if you, if you need school meals, you're, on the, you're more likely to be in, in poverty. And so children who are experiencing homelessness are really getting a double whammy here, aren't they? They're living in an environment that actually doesn't help them to learn, um, an environment that's not nurturing, um, a difficult environment because you're always moving. Um, but also on top of that, you don't have enough money for food, you're getting free school meals. And this diagram, or this, this slide actually shows you from the Marmot Review, um, that does have an impact on your development and your education later on. So again, you start going up the ladder, you come down the ladder, you start going up the ladder, you come down the ladder. Another challenge that we have with um, that sort of housing that we put children in, um, who are experiencing homelessness in is that they don't have many cooking facilities, they're on low income, no space for exercise, we've talked about that, and poor living conditions, rats, bed bugs, mold. And why do we need good nutrition again? We come back to that story again because your bones need good nutrition. You need protein, calcium, phosphorus, all of these other things we know about. You've all heard of rickets. If you don't get vitamin D, you get rickets, brittle bones. However, when we think of stunting and obesity, um, we actually think of low middle income countries. I was trying to look at the data today and I was going, okay, I'll Google stunting in the UK, stunting in the UK. All the stunting um, publications, most of them, and I can miss, be missing them, really talk mainly about low middle income countries. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Are we going to have stunted children in the UK because of low poor nutrients? And stunting in itself is a marker of poor brain development, poor future life chances. Um, and if you're experiencing homelessness, you again have layer upon layer of adverse circumstances. As we've said, physical development is really important. You need to run around, you need to exercise, which again, if you're in a cramped condition, you can't do. But one key item here, if you see at the bottom of there, is immune system. If you have a poor immune system, you pick up infection and you go round and round in this unbreakable cycle. So just to keep you all awake, just a little story here. Um, and this is, this is um, from Shelter. This is Will's story. Life in the B&B is horrible. 
It's worse than being in a real life horror film. There's no room to do anything. I don't get to play that often. Sometimes me and my little brother, Harry, we fight for the one chair because we both want to sit at the table. That constant aggravation, that constant fighting with each other, just think of that, that sort of impact on you as a child. So we come to poor housing conditions and what does that mean? Well, if you have poor housing conditions, you have damp, which gives you more respiratory infections. You have pests, bed bugs, that gives you more infections. You have noise outside. So you're stressful, you're scared, you're frightened all the time, can have increased stress levels that we've talked about the neurological development. You're worried about going outside because there might be people sitting outside your room and you can't sleep at night. So another story, Jenny's story. It is awful. They are trying to get in here all the time. They keep nicking stuff from us. There are needles all over the place and broken glass. You can smell the drugs in the rooms. At night, you can't sleep. I'm worried they will come and take my children. How horrible for a mother. And what I'm trying to show you here is, I've been talking a lot about the child, but on top of the child, some of the protective factors for children are the fact that the mother and the father can actually parent their child. Now, if you're fearful all the time, and you're scared what's going to happen, your coping mechanisms as, as the parent are much, much more challenged than they would be. And again, there's that connection between parents feeling safe, children feeling safe, and this sort of dual relationship that has to happen for a child to grow. Just here are some more quotes. These are, these are from different children, some living in hotels, some living in um, other, other um, environments, you know, increased cigarette smoke, which is going to affect their lungs. Um, they're going to see, see alcoholism. And if you think of this, if this was a child who wasn't experiencing homelessness and they were seeing somebody being an alcoholic in front of them or somebody with drugs in front of them, um, not eating, what would we be saying in society? Is it neglect? So what are we doing in society? Are we neglecting these children? And I think, you know, we have a wake up call here of what are we actually doing as a society for these children? So this is just the um, environmental cycle I was trying to talk about. We have poor housing, which gives you respiratory infection. And that respiratory infection, if you get any infection, whether it's respiratory infection or not, um, you have an increased metabolic rate in your body. You need more fuel to keep your body going. So if you need more fuel, you don't get enough nutrition, again, your immunity is affected. And if your immunity is affected, you get more illnesses and you just go round and round and round. So what do we need to be doing as a society and all of you here today um, to try and break this cycle for children? This is just a slide showing um, really some of the different infections that children can get. So skin ailments, respiratory infections, gastrointestinal disorders and chronic physical disorders as well. The other part of what I've talked about is social and emotional development. We have to think about security, emotional stability, consistent attachments. Now, if you are in one place and after a few weeks you're told you have to move to a different location, far away from your friends, far away from other children that you used to play with, um, far away from family, how can you keep an attachment? How can you develop? How do you learn how to um, develop your social and emotional development through life? So this just shows you again about a little bit of information about poor psychological adjustment. It means that you're less socially supported by your peers um, and you get deficits in academic achievement. Insecure attachments can lead to emotional and social incompetence, especially anger. You get, you know, children are going to get angry if they don't have that protective factor around them. Um, and we know that children who have been in temporary accommodation more than one year are over three times more likely to have mental health problems. So you can see, you talk about ACEs, but actually we're starting at the beginning here and you can see what's coming ahead of us if we don't do something about this. The importance of play as well. You know, you think of children in a very small place, how can they actually play? You know, we, we hear from some of the reports of some of the spaces being as the small of 13 to 18 meters squared. I mean, that's really tiny for a child to play in. Or they can't go on the floor because they're too scared because like we said, there are rats or there's uh, or the cockroaches on the floor. So they can't develop their, their cognitive motor development and skills of playing. They can't be creative. They can't bond with friends. So we're talking a little bit about play. We're, we're, we're talking about housing and how that's going to affect children. 
overcrowding, unsafe neighborhoods, risk of injury, all affects the fact that you're not going to be able to play, you're not going to be able to have that interaction with the children around you. This again is just another picture um, which was supported by the Magpie Project, where one of um, my Diana Rosenthal again took this picture in somebody's home with the consent, of course, of the family. And if you can see, there's a high chair in the corner, and that's where the child has to sit and be strapped in so that they don't cause harm because there's a safety issue here. If you can see there's a cooker as well on the right hand side. If that child is crawling around touching the cooker, something happens, what are we going to say to the mother? And so she's having to strap a child in where they can't move, can't have any motor development because she's so scared of that child's safety. So coming to adverse childhood experiences, you're going to talk a lot about this, I'm sure. But the more ch adverse child um, experiences there are, the more likely there is in the future that there's going to be um, adverse events later on in life. And we all know what those are, um, mental health and, and, and alcoholism and all of those other things. Yet funny enough, it, childhood experiencing homelessness is not considered ad as an adverse childhood experience. And I know we can debate this and there'll be people on both sides of the fence and that's fine, but it's an adversity of some sort. It is some sort of exposure to an adversity. So just look at this diagram here. This sort of talks again about what I've been talking about. What's the long-term impact of ACEs? And we know all of this. We have lots and lots of data on this. And we know that you're going to be putting a child at risk in adulthood if they have ACEs. Yet we talk about and this is some American work where we talk about the local context contributing to that, yet we don't call childhood homelessness an ACE at all. So coming back to COVID, you're going to you know, be thinking a lot about COVID and the impact of COVID over the next couple of days. COVID has hit everybody. We know it's hit everybody, but it's actually hit children experiencing homelessness harder than anybody else. Children have been put in some all in conditions. Um, they've not had access to um, you know, all the computers and digital access that maybe all, some other children have. Some of them so won't even have a radio. They won't even have heard any noise for so long apart from the banging in the shelters that they're in. Um, and there'll be lots and lots of struggles going on as we know. Access to food has been a problem. We don't know how many will now be um, malnourished. We, you know, we may have children who look obese, but they've actually got nutrient deficiencies. We don't know what's going to happen to their iron and vitamin D levels. They've been exposed to many risks emotionally that we have no knowledge of what that's going to have on their mental health later on. And they've had restricted access to health visitors. We know why that is. It's not because health visitors don't want to see the children, but there's been a, a limited access to services. So many children who are experiencing homelessness and who have developmental issues already get a double whammy again because they have not been able to be um, seen by therapists or even recognize that they've got developmental delays, never mind having the interventions that they need. We also know that some places have managed to get school meals to these children, but lots of places haven't. So we don't know about nutrition. We, we talked about this and I've just mentioned all of this about lack of peer support, structured exercise, things that have happened to everybody, but a lot worse for these children. So this is why, and Alex kindly mentioned the Champions Project, um, that we with my colleagues have um, actually going to be looking at what the impact of COVID has had on these children. Um, and we're going to be working in partnership and co-developing uh, recommendations with the families and trying to be advocates for them and bring this to the forefront of the policy makers. And just to say thank you to um, all my colleagues who'll be working with us on this project and also to Laura Swaby, who is my colleague who helped me with some of these slides today as well. In that project, we have another conceptual map. You can see I like maps. And the reason I like maps is it allows us to actually lay down lots and lots of areas where we can see where the challenges are for um, children. Now, what you can see from this, from the first map, you saw all the barriers, which and that was not in COVID time. Now what we've been doing is brainstorming. So this is just our brainstorming and we're at the beginning of this and this will keep refining. Um, and again, you won't be able to read all of this. Um, but actually what this is, is a map of what are all the things that have actually been challenging children, under five particularly, um, but this applies to lots of older children as well, um, during COVID. And these are the things we'll be looking at to see how we can intervene or what some of the things are 
we can address through policy and through your um, work with us all. So in summary, what's the impact of homelessness? The impact of homelessness, you have impact on parents, you have impact on the developing fetus and the newborn, you have impact on the children naught to five, and you have impact on young people aged to 15. Some of those are relevant to health. You know, what are the services that we are actually providing for these children? Do we have targeted services for children under five? Well, we have the Healthy Child Programme, we all know. That covers immunizations, it covers assessments for children, um, it covers um, conversations around dental care. Um, but actually, you know, navigating the system is really, really hard. Um, if you need to get a dental appointment, you have to try and find a dentist and then you have to try and get an appointment and you have to be able to have that um, empowerment, that candidacy to, to be able to actually navigate the system to get an appointment. And then as you get an appointment and you think you've sorted it, you get moved and you start that whole process all over again and you start having to find a new GP and you have to find a new place to go to. So what happens is you miss appointments, you miss immunizations, and then you get labeled with a stigma of you didn't want to attend or you were a person who didn't want your children to have those appointments, which isn't the case. We need to together find an easier way for families to actually navigate this system that we have put in place for the majority population. And why should we do it? People can say, oh, well, you know, what's the point? You know, we've got many other things to worry about, but it's because, um, and if you talk to the economists, I'm sure they'll say this as well, it's about long-term benefits of investing in change. Wow. Um, if you invest now, you actually benefit the future. So if we have, we, we, we put in interventions early, as I'm trying to suggest, and many of my colleagues suggest, um, we save money long term. The NHS will save money. You can see this, tackling homelessness early could save the government between 3,000 and 18,000 for every person helped. We know that there's a link between ACE and homelessness. I've mentioned this and you'll talk a lot about it. So the WHO have said early childhood development is one of the best investments government can make in a society's future. It not only helps children and families thrive, it helps break cycles of poverty and inequity and contribute to happier, healthier populations. Now, if you are in a house that is warm, that is safe, you're not being moved around, all of that contributes to your development. I've just tried to explain that. And what I'm trying to explain is not just about the quality of the housing, it's about the environment the child lives, about the frequent moving. It's about us thinking about children experiencing homelessness. So what I, I'm here really today is thinking of this, how can we call you all to action? What can we do to make us all think together about starting at the beginning, starting at that critical age and recognizing it as an age in itself when we need to put more resources and the other big critical age is adolescence, and we'll be doing some work on that as well. Um, I haven't focused a lot on that today, but actually, you know, too, the whole childhood is important, but actually critical age is adolescence because risk-taking behaviour, you're going into adulthood, but early childhood, very, very important if we're actually going to prevent future problems. So we need to have safe sleeping equipment. We need to make it safe for children. We need to end mixing um, families with single adults. This all is uh, uh, being provided by the Shared Health Foundation. You know, they've made these recommendations already. We need to think of the national quality standard for temporary accommodation that ensures the safety and protection of everyone. And we need to create local action groups. We also need to think about what are the housing conditions that we want our children to be in? What would we want for our own children? And is this fair for other children? How can we work across sector? If you look at it at the moment, we have a lot of people working in housing, people working in health, people working in education. How can we actually have an integrated interdisciplinary approach that brings the sectors together and has a conversation collectively about the problems rather than in our own different sectors? This isn't a sector problem, this is a child problem and we need to put the child at the center. We need to have a national register. I mean, this is something that is really, really challenging. Um, we know there are children under five in households, but we don't know where they are. They are invisible. Just as I can't see all of you, these children are invisible. And if we don't know where children are, how do you put resources to actually um, address the issues we've been talking about? 
how do you um, identify resources for health visitors or targeted health specialists to actually go out and work with these families and give those children a better starting life. And what we hope to do as part of our call to action is um, work together um, to create an APPG um, around children experiencing homelessness that will bring all the sectors together, allow collective collaborative conversations. So just so that we finish, um, and, and I, I want to make sure I finish on time to give, uh, give time for us to have questions as well. It's, it's, I want to finish with this. History will judge us by the difference we make in the everyday lives of our children. And I really believe that when people look back tomorrow at COVID and people look at what we have done as a society and as a country for the most marginalized children and the most worst affect children in our country, they will actually judge us by what we do today. So hopefully this evening is a beginning um, of a discussion over the next few days um, of what we can actually do moving into the future. Thank you, Alex.